Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because he loves you so much. All right. Happy Father's Day, uh, dads. Thank you so much for all that you do and uh, all that you are. Your role is so important. So we're going to celebrate with that uh, barbecue uh, after this service, just in the gym. It's free. So everyone is welcome, whether you're a father or not, please come and join us and celebrate together. Also wanted to invite you to one other thing. We started it last night after service on Saturday nights, all summer long, uh, we're doing the gathering. And so after service on Saturday night, we go out to the patio, uh, we turn the lights on, fire pits, and we have live music and some cornhole. And we had the Avs game going last night, and uh, we're just going to hang out together. It's just a chance to be together, to make some new friends, new connections. So I want to invite you every Saturday night after service to join us for the gathering. You know, as we talk about Father's Day uh, this weekend, there is something so powerful about a man or a woman who rises to the occasion. About someone, a man or a woman, or even a child for that matter, who decides to lead when we need a leader. And if you contrast two leaders who are facing the same situation, but two different ways that they came at it. You think about Churchill and Chamberlain as they're facing Hitler and they're facing World War II. The way that they came about it made all the difference. The way they led made all the difference. And Churchill, you know, what an amazing leader who rose up in a time of need. And he said, you know, it's not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we need to do what is required. I love that. That's what a leader says. That I will do what is required. And if you contrast that to Neville Chamberlain, he, he was the one who, as Hitler was coming down and, and uh, starting to spread out, he said, how horrible, how fantastic, how incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. And of course, what he contended for and what he wanted and what he was all about was peace in our time. And see, that's the opposite of leading, is when you see something out on the horizon, say, oh, thank goodness it's out on the horizon. Thank goodness that it's just going to be there, it's not going to affect me. And Churchill understood, that see, you can't make a bargain with Hitler. Listen, follower of Jesus, you can't make a bargain with the enemy of our soul. You can't be friends with the world. Listen, it will not stop. He will not stop until you are destroyed. And the only way that we deal with Satan is to fight him, to resist him, to rebuke him. We don't make deals with him. And right now, we're in a world that is so hungry, so desperate for leaders. You know, I, I don't know what he was like as a president, but boy, Zelensky right now, as a world leader, it's pretty amazing. I'm mean, just watching, and, and I mean, so many people say that, that the difference between Russia and right now and Ukraine is him and his leadership. And I, I don't think that's all, but it's certainly part of it. Because a leader like that inspires his men and his women to rise up, to fight, to take a stand. And where Russia, you hear that the soldiers are poking holes in their own fuel tanks. These men are stirred, and they're moved up. I mean, I, I just thought, I, I don't know who he is really, but I was just so amazed when I heard, you know, when our government was telling him, okay, well, we can help you. We'll, we'll get you a ride to safety and we'll give you sanctuary. And you remember what he said? He says, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. That's a leader. leader leadership is such a powerful force. And it wins wars and it inspires people and it can tear down, it can build nations, it can destroy communities or build up communities. And I want you to understand something. Listen, every man, every woman, every child in this room, I want you to get this, understand this. You are a leader. I don't care how old you are. Every man, every woman, every child in this room, you are a leader because you have influence You have influence in your home, you have influence in your schools, you have influence in the city, you have influence in this ministry. And what kind of leader are you going to be? Are you the type of leader who will say, I just want peace in our time? Or are you the leader who will say, I will do whatever it takes. I will do what is necessary for this generation and the next generation and those who are around me and those who are coming behind me. 
This country is desperate for leaders right now. Desperate for people who will rise up. Are you going to say, take me to safety or bring me some ammunition? Because we need you to lead. We need spiritual leaders. The world is crying out for people who will stand for what is right. Who won't run away for safety and comfort. Just to kind of live the good life. It's looking for people who will live the kingdom life. Who will stand for Christ. You know, I've been looking around. and Have you noticed that so many of the leaders that we've looked to, the religious leaders, they're, they're like retiring. They're dying. Some of them are blowing out. You know, I just, Rick Warren, just last week, I think he, um, he just retired. He's been quite a leader in our nation, a spiritual leader for a while. And I've been praying. I was like, Lord, well, well who's the next Billy Graham? Lord, who are you going to raise up a man? But you see, I don't think God is looking for a man. I think God is looking for a multitude. I think he's looking for you, and he's looking for me, and he's saying, here it is, will you lead in your quiet little way, in our little world, in our little sphere of influence, will we lead forward in Christ? I think that's what God is looking for right now, and I don't think we need another Billy Graham, I think we need you, and I think we need you to take the place that God has put you in, whether you are a man or a woman or a child, you are a leader, and we need you to stand up, and we need you to lead. Kingdom leaders who use our spiritual weapons of warfare, who use prayer, who act righteously, who live in integrity, who reach out, who who act on behalf of the defenseless and the weak and the poor, who care, who reach out. The world is desperate for leaders right now. So we're going to ancient wisdom as we're looking at leaders and seeing what the Bible has to say. We've been going through Proverbs in this series. And so Proverbs has a lot to say about leadership, especially as it looks at kings and leaders. And so if you look at Proverbs 16, 29, the first point, the first thing I want you to see about leadership, it says, a violent man entices his neighbor and leads him down a path that is not good. And the reason I wanted you to see that is I wanted you to understand that your leadership reverberates around you. And whether you're a violent man or you're a righteous man, it goes out and brings other people along with you. See, your righteousness, if you just decide to stand for righteousness, it actually lifts other people up into righteousness. And if you decide that you're going to live for yourself and selfishness, it's actually going to draw people down with you. And when you take a stand, it stirs other souls and it strengthens them. Spurs us on. So here's the the first question I have for you. Are you creating a wake right now? Are you caught in a wake? Are you making a wake or are you caught in a wake? You know, I have asked a lot of people about their faith, and it's amazing to me how many people I'll say, hey, tell me a little bit about your background, tell me about your church, tell me about your faith. And when I ask them about their faith, they start talking about their grandma. And like, well, I don't really, I'm not, but my grandma, woo! My grandma, she's just, and you know what, your grandma's awesome, and she's powerful, and, and we love grandma warriors, and we're so thankful. But listen, her wake won't cut it for you. You've got to decide who are you. Your spouse, they can't pull you along to Christ. You have to decide who are you in Jesus. Even your parents, listen, their faith isn't enough for you. You have to decide, is this my faith? Who am I in Jesus? Am I a leader in Christ? And you have to decide, am I a follower or am I a fan of Christ? Am I a kingdom person or am I a world person? And every single one of us has to decide, am I going to be the leader that God has called me to be, whether you are a man, woman, or child? And here's the second question. Where is your wake pulling other people? Because like it or not, you are pulling and influencing other people. Are you a light bearer? Are you a life bringer? I'm watching my, uh, my daughter, Joy, right now. She's, she's been influencing me lately. She just came back from her second a trip to Tanzania with YWAM and she's on fire and everywhere we go she's like praying for people and ministering to people and just I'm like oh, I want to be like her and her fire is raising me up is your fire raising other people up drawing other people in or is your complacency just bringing them into complacency it's because wherever you are whatever you do you are leading 
you're impacting people. Look at it. It's, it's so small. I mean, even Proverbs 16, 15, just go one, over, one page over from where we were here before. 15, it says, when a king's face brightens, when a leader's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in the rain. Do you see what that is? That even your countenance affects the people around you? And what happens when you come into the room? Dads, when you come home, do they say, oh, dad's home. Or do they say, oh, dad's home. What do you bring? What happens when you come into the room? When you come into the office? When you come into the group? What, 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 what do you bring with you? You know, uh, we just went to Florida for a conference and we had a little family vacation. And the night before we were to leave, I was looking at uh, our flight itinerary. And I'm looking at Naya's flight and it didn't exist. I mean, I couldn't find it. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, we're going to have to leave Naya when we all go to Florida. <laughs> and it's, I'm like, oh. And I'm like freaking out and I'm getting all tense. And then I'm looking around and I'm like, man, Jesus, grumpy. I'm like, bud, what's Joy, why am Joy and I like the dog? What's this dog's problem? And I realized they're queuing off of me. I mean, the, the, see, I was all tense and I'm freaking out. And everybody's like, oh, dad, stay away from dad. And they weren't grumpy, I was. They were just picking it up. And see, you come into the room and you change the atmosphere. And see, I, I know that as a father, I have the ability that when I come on, even my countenance can affect those around me. And I have power to bring peace and happiness and joy and life and laughter into my home. Or I can bring stress and anxiety and fear like, oh, he's here. Because leaders, listen, leaders are revealed under pressure. I mean, that's what we see with Zelensky right now. Alex and Yana, they brought me a, a shirt back that says, uh, Zelensky is my president. I thought that was pretty cool. Thanks, guys, for that. We're seeing who he is, who he is. It's being revealed as he's being pinched. So when you're tired, when you're disappointed, when you're sick of it, when things aren't going like you want them to go, when you feel like I am not being appreciated right now, that's when we find out if you're a leader. That's when we find out what it's really about. Is it about you or is it about them? And if you're a leader, it's always about them. That's when we find out if you're really leading or not, when it's difficult for you. And the, the world right now is crying out for biblical leaders who, despite how they feel, despite the difficulties that they face, face they're going to stand for righteousness and they're going to bring life and they're going to bring peace. And they're going to bring joy and they're going to bring hope into the middle of their world. And you know what? There is so much opportunity right now for us. It's, it has never been so easy to lead. It has never been so easy to be different. You know, when we were in the airport, I couldn't believe like how grumpy everybody is. Everyone's so mad. Heaven forbid that you lose someone's back. Holy cow. That's the start of World War III. How could you slight someone? I mean, the people are so mad. If you, if you want to wave the little TSA wand just like one extra time on someone, how dare you? You know? And, and what opportunity we have right now. I mean, just love is so powerful right now. They will know we are Christians by our love. It's never been more true than right now. And our kindness that can lead them to repentance. Kindness has never been so powerful. What an opportunity we have. Just be kind. How powerful it is. How powerful it is to lead just to be kind. Just to walk in joy. It's so important, follower of Jesus, that, that we got we to quit grousing and complaining and grumping like everybody else is. And we decide, no, 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 so you could go that way, but I'm actually going to lead and I'm going to go this way. And I'm going to choose hope and I'm going to choose life. And I'm going to be full of joy because this is my right and who I am in Christ. And I know how this whole thing ends. What powerful leadership to say I'm going to act in the opposite of what the world is doing right now. And you have to understand that any step towards Jesus, any step towards truth, any step towards life, man, it is a powerful way to lead. However small it is, it is leadership. Years and years ago, Gina was driving and, and she was frustrated. And I don't remember why. And she's just like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And oh, I'm so frustrated. And I don't even remember which kid it was. It was a little blonde one, which could have been any of them. <laughs> Except for Naya. And uh, one of them... Uh, it said, uh, she must have been three or four years old. Gina's like, mm -mm. And one of the kids said, pray, mommy. <laughs> what? Mommy, pray. That's leadership. Did you know that you could lead from the back seat? 
you know you don't have to be in charge and you can lead? I mean, you see it all the time. You don't have to be the boss to be the leader at your work. You don't have to be the boss to be the leader in the ministry. It's one who decides, no matter what's going on, I'm going to go towards Christ. See, that's where leadership starts. It says, okay, I'm going to look at Jesus. What an opportunity we have right now. We just fix our eyes on Jesus. And the rest of the world's going this way and that way and freak out. We're like, no, no, no. This is the way. I'm going this way. You want to come with me? You want to come along to life? You want to come along to freedom? You want to come along to joy? This is the way I'm going to go right now. You come. In biblical, God-honoring leadership, it touches eternity. It reverberates out beyond us to everyone we meet, everyone we touch. And see, we look to Jesus, and he shows us the way to go. So let's just see what Jesus has to say about leadership. Go over to the Gospels here. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 10. And Jesus tells us what leadership looks like to him. If you want to know what a leader does, a godly leader, let's see what Jesus does. And he says in chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd, which I think you could just as well say, I am the good leader of my children. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What does he do? A good leader. Did you hear that, leaders? A good leader lays down his or her life for those he or she leads. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. He's just using them. Just getting what they want. See, that's not leadership, to get what you want. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. But not Jesus. I am the good shepherd. And I love this. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Do you understand what a leader does? First of all, he knows you and you know him. But then as a leader, you know those you lead and they know you. There's a relational part of leadership. We have to know what makes them tick. We have to know their hearts. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I, again, what does he do? I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that not, are not of this pen. He's talking about the Gentiles because he's talking to Jews right here. And he's like, I've got to bring the Gentiles in too. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And I love this. No one takes it from me. No one makes Jesus do anything. But he lays it down on my own accord. Leaders, are you going to lay down your life on your own accord? You don't have to, but you can do it on your own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my Father. And here we are. What God-honoring leaders do is they lay down their lives for others. That's how he shepherds. And look at the results. Billions of people follow this amazing leader, Jesus. Because the world says, no, as I'm a leader, you're working for me. You're working for my success. But that's not what Jesus says. In Christ, the leader's goal is actually your growth. The leader's growth for me as I lead my family, it's the growth and the life of my family. My goal for my kids and my family is their walk with Jesus. That's my goal. And on this Father's Day, I think it's appropriate that we think a little bit about headship, about spiritual leadership. If you look at Ephesians 5.23, it tells you, husbands, that you are the head. You're the spiritual leader of the home. And you know what? That has almost nothing to do with you getting what you want. In fact, I I have five ladies in me in my house. And I'll tell you what. I've eaten more tofu and hummus than any man should ever have to eat. (laughs) Because I don't always get what I want. I very often don't get what I want. And it's so tempting for us to just check out men. It's so tempting. Like, ah, I just don't know what they want. I don't know how to do this. But dads, listen, dads, I want you to understand that you are representing the father to your kids. Whether you like it or not, you are giving them a picture of what the heavenly father does. That's what we are doing. What a responsibility he's given us. No wonder so many people feel God is distant. No wonder so many people think, oh God, he just just doesn't really care. Oh, it just seems like God's just always so far away. No wonder they think that way. I'm so proud of you fathers who have engaged There's so many people here right now who didn't have dads that are being incredible dads. I'm so proud of you. Saying, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to show them to the best of my ability what a father is like. Because you know what leaders do is they persist. And they persist. And they persist. My grandpa, uh, he owned a a gas station in North Denver. 
And he was a quiet guy and, and didn't do anything spectacular. He built some churches for laborers for Christ in his retirement. But, but you know what his mo- I think his most amazing accomplishment was? He stayed married to my grandma for 65 years. And he persisted. And so now he has seven grandchildren who know that it can happen. Who know what it should be like. And we remember grandpa. And every time I think about grandpa, I just remember how for 65 years he kept loving And he kept serving, and he kept working, and he stuck in there with that family. And here I am right now. Today, actually, is my 29th anniversary for Gina and I. Yeah, I'm excited about that. But Grandpa, Grandpa reminds me, I'm not even half done yet. Grandpa reminds me, i got to keep persisting. What a legacy. You know, so much of us, our, our leadership is just quiet. It's persistent. But Grandpa, 65 years, I mean, it's the loudest thing he's ever done. It speaks so loudly to to generations. And we remember Grandpa kept going and Grandpa kept going. And I failed my family so many times, listen, but I will not quit. And I want you to understand, young fathers, listen, they don't need you to be perfect. You don't always have to get it right. They just need you to engage. They need you to do what you can do. They need you to persist. They need you to just lead your family to Jesus the very best you can. And you're like, I don't know how, but listen, you have what it takes. His divine power has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Power of him who's called us. He's going to give you what it takes to lead your family if you just say, okay, I'll do it. And I'll persist and I'll keep going. And listen, I want to challenge you. Lead your children to Jesus and bring your family to prayer and pray for your family. When's the last time you just got before God? And, oh, Lord, help this daughter. Help this son. Help my wife. Help, help my family. And teach them integrity by your example. Be the same person that you are at home, that you are at church, that you are at work. Let them see it so they can live it. Teach them to apologize, not by saying you need to apologize, but showing them how you apologize. Teach them what it means to be humble. Show them what it means to be there and to be there and to be there. See, the thing about leadership, though, is we have to understand the people that we're leading. You know, so here, here's my definition of a leader. A leader is someone, when they take the hill and they plant the flag, they look around and there's other people there. And if you've gone up there and you've taken the hill and no one's come with you, you've just taken a hill. You haven't led anyone. And see, leaders, they have to understand, they have to work work and understand the people that they lead. And we enter their world. Listen, if you're the leader, you enter their world. You don't demand that they enter your world. We had this uh, horrible, horrible game when my girls were growing up called Pretty Pretty Princess. And uh, what you do is uh, you roll the dice and you play this game and you put on different pieces of jewelry as you go. And and you know what? A tiara doesn't look very good on a bald man. (laughs) And I've played Pretty Pretty Princess more than I ever want to admit. I hope to never, ever play it again. But I would say things like, hey, guys, you want to go play catch? And they would say, hey, daddy, let's play Pretty Pretty Princess instead. (laughs) You meet them where they're at. You reach out to their world, right? Now, when you meet them, then you call them out. You call them up, and you call them forward, and you cheer them on. You say, we're going to go beyond this. We're going to go further. There's so much more for you. I love, I love watching right now how my girls are just passing me up in everything. They're better at, at everything than I am. And I love it. Go. Go. But as we lead, we've got to keep a pace that they can keep up with. And dads, moms, be careful when you look around and you've lost them. You got to go back. Come on, you can do it. Let's keep going. Here's another timeless truth. God honoring leaders confront wickedness in their realm of influence. So let's look at uh, Proverbs 28 here real quick. Proverbs 28, 10. He who leads the upright along an evil path, will fall into his own trap. Where are you leading your family? Where are you leading those around you? But the blameless will receive a good inheritance. See, we lead others in to righteousness. We lead away from wickedness. And first of all, leaders, it starts with us, doesn't it? The best way to lead into righteousness is to confront our own wickedness. 
And what a tragedy that so many of us, I mean, we're fathers. We're the ones who are there to protect our families. We're the ones to keep the evil one away. What a tragedy it is when we're the ones who bring it in. And we need to look here and say, no, I'm going to push that out, especially in me. And then we do it in those that we lead, and we do it in those that we love. See, where you have influence, listen, stand against evil and push back evil. And if it's wrong, refuse to support it, refuse to allow it in. Resist it, fight it, do not let that into your home. And moms and dads, listen, I want to give you permission, especially of teenagers and middle schoolers, but I'm sorry, teenagers and middle schools, actually I'm not. Listen, your parents have the right to say, we are not watching that in my home. We are not listening to that in my home. I I tell my kids, when you get your own home, you can listen to that stuff. But we're not playing that stuff in my house. Because if you don't resist it, who will? And listen, parents, you need to protect your kids from those smartphones. I mean, we're the ones who handed it to them. And then we complain about what they're watching and what they're seeing. And if we don't engage, who will? If we don't come in and step in, who's going to protect them? But you know what? It's a lot harder now than it used to be. It's a new challenge. Because you know what? It's everywhere. Before I could say, well, no, we're just not going to give you that. And, you know, I knew how to set the boundaries. Now, you know, as Joy was getting older, I would actually have to hand her the phone. I'd say, hey, Joy, would you put some parental restrictions on your phone so you can't get into things I don't want you to get into? You know, she would go, okay, there, Dad. Now I'm safe. Right? So you know what the new challenge is? Is you have to teach your kids how. And you have to teach them why. Because they're going to find it. It's out there. You're going to have to show them what they need to stay away from. You're going to have to show them how, and you're going to have to show them why. And yes, you're going to draw boundaries, and you're going to put your parental restrictions and all that on, but they will get around them eventually. And they're going to have to know why they shouldn't. And they're going to have to know how to react when they come. Let's look at Proverbs 31, another aspect of leadership here. Proverbs 31, verse 4, says, It's not for kings, it's not for leaders O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, and not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. And I want you to understand that none of us as leaders, none of us are perfect, but you know, like it or not, we are called to a higher standard. Like it or not, your behavior influences more than you. And so you have a responsibility for what you do. And it's a, it's a very un-American idea, but you know what? I can't do whatever I want. Because what I do will impact you. What I do will impact my family. It'll have every sphere of influence. It'll, have, it'll reverberate into their lives. So I cannot do anything that I want to do. There are too many lives. There's too much. See, I, I have a wife and I have four kids. And I have the ability to shake their world. I have the ability to just to shatter their faith. I, I, have, I have the ability to break their hearts. But I need to lead myself. You know the hardest person to lead is yourself. And that's where it begins. We confront the wickedness within us for the sake of those that we touch, for the sake of those that we lead. And you know what? It's not a popularity contest. And I'm not out here trying to get people to like me, and I'm not trying to get my kids to enjoy every decision because I'm trying to protect them, I'm trying to help them grow, and I care about who they become. Popularity is is nothing. Did you know what president had the highest approval rating of all time? Since approval ratings have been taken, do you know who had the highest one ever? George W. Bush. Right after uh, 9-11, it was over 90%. Now it went down after that. But is he the best of all time? You know who had a horrible approval rating? Abraham Lincoln. About half the country hated him. And he he was one of the best leaders we've ever seen. It's not about if they like you or they don't like you. It's about how you impact them. It's how you affect them. It's about where are you taking them? What are we standing for and where are we going? And sometimes my kids don't like it. And sometimes the staff isn't real excited about it. And I need to check my heart and I need to be humble. And I need to ask, but it's like, Lord, where are we going? And wherever you're leading, God, I will follow. I have my eyes on Jesus and I'm going. Do you want to come along? And I love some of the things that Abraham Lincoln said. Here, here's the one with a horrible approval, approval rating. This is some of the things that he said. Character, it's like a tree. And reputation, it's shadow. The shadow is what we think it is. The tree is the real thing. 
Your character is the real thing. Your reputation is just a shadow. He said this, I'm not bound to win, but I am bound to be true. I'm not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live up to what light I have. Oh, that's a beautiful leader's mantra. I am bound to live up to what light I have. Lincoln said, I would rather be a little nobody than to be an evil somebody. He said, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Boy, that's my concern. I just want to be on your side, Jesus. And this one, not about leadership, but it's just a good Lincoln. If I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one? That's pretty good. You know, Lincoln was one of those men who led. He's one of those men that was an incredible leader. And it wasn't about what everybody else thought. It was about who he became and how he impacted those he led. What kind of leader are you? Man, we need right now, we need you to lead. Your family needs you to lead. This community needs you to lead. Your schools, they oh, they need you so bad to lead. When they say, we're going this way and we're going with the world, we need you so desperately to say, you know what, go ahead, but I'm going this way. You want to come with me? When they say, this is the way to do it, and you know, this is what the world demands, we say, no, no, so in my family, this is the way we're doing. Come on, kids, come with me. We need you in this ministry to step up and lead. And I know some of us, we long to go back. We long to go back to comfort. We long to go back to life before COVID. We certainly long to go back to cheaper gas. I know I long for that. But all we have now is forward. And leaders decide beforehand, like Joshua did. And Joshua said, you know, you can go back, you can chase your idols. But I made a decision. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you? As for you and your house, what? As for you and your house, where are you going to go? As for you and your house, what are you going to become? As for you and your house, where are you going to take them? I'll tell you what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to be a kingdom man. The only way forward, the only way forward is to live for the kingdom. And we need people who will be people of prayer. And we need people be people of God's presence and we need people who are going to be people of power in God and we need people who are going to be men and women of righteousness and integrity and truth and we're going to give and we're going to grow as we gather and we're going to move forward in Christ with all of our mind we're giving our lives to him and we're we're going to believe that there's a better future for those who are behind us and a better future for those around us and see I believe there's a better future for you and it has to do with bringing a better future to those you know And we need you to be a champion who shapes your life after the great champion, after the great king of kings. And we need you right now to decide who will you be, where will you go, and where will you take those that you lead. As for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. So Father, I just thank you for these leaders. Thank you for these fathers, these mothers, these sons, these daughters. Lord, I thank you that you've called them to lead. And Lord, some of them quietly, some of them loud and brash. But Father, I pray that we would lead with all our might towards Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would look at you, the perfecter of our hearts and souls, our great redeemer. And Lord, we would be people who lay down our lives for others and we lead like Jesus. And when the world goes that way, we go this way. And when the enemy calls us to make a bargain, we refuse and we stand firm in the truth. And Lord, I ask that it would just rise up in us this resistance, this determination, God. And Lord, we don't pray for a ride out of this. We pray for ammunition through it. We pray for power for it so that we can lead and bring life where we go here. Father, we thank you that the victory is ours in yours in Jesus Christ as we lead towards you. Thank you, Lord, that you are our champion. You are our great leader in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.